part two basic techniques in analyzing worry chapter four how to analyze and solve worry problems i keep six honest serving men they taught me all i knew their names are what and why and when and how and where and who rudyard kipling <coughs> will the magic formula of willis edge carrier describe in part one chapter two solve all worry problem no of course not then what is the answer? The answer is that we must equip ourselves to deal with different kinds of worries by learning the three basic steps of problem analysis. The three steps are get the fact and number two is analyze the fact. Number three is arrive at a decision and then act on that decision. Obvious stuff, yes, Aristotle taught it and use it and you and I must use it too if we are going to solve the problems that are harassing us and turning our days and nights into veritable hells. Let's take the first rule, get the fact, why is it so important to get the fact because unless we have the fact, we can't possibly even attempt to solve our problems intelligently. Without the facts, all we can do is sleep around in confusion. My idea? No, that was the idea of the late Herbert E. Hawkins. Dean of Columbia College, Columbia University, for 22 years, he had helped 200,000 200, students solve their worry problems, and he told me that confusion is the chief cause of worry. He put it this way, he had half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision. For example, he said, if I have a problem which has to be faced at 3 o'clock next Tuesday, I refuse even to try to make a decision about it until next Tuesday arrive. In the meantime, I concentrate on getting all the facts that bear on the problem. I don't worry, he said, I don't ag agonize over my problem. I don't lose any sleep. I simply concentrate on getting the fad fact. And by the time Tuesday rolls around, if I got all the fact, the problem usually solves itself. I asked Dean Hawks if this meant he had like worry entirely. Yes, he said, I think I can honestly say that my life my life is now almost totally devoid of worry. I have found, he went on, that if a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worry usually evaporates in the light of knowledge. Let me repeat this. If a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worries will usually evaporate in the light of knowledge. But what do most of us do if we bother with facts at all? And Thomas Edison said in all seriousness, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the labor of thinking. If we bother with facts at all, we hunt like bird dogs after the fact that bluster up what we already think and ignore all the others we want only the facts that justify our acts he acts the acts that fit in conveniently with our wishful thinking and justify our preconceived prejudices and andrew and andrew muris put it everything that is in agreement with personal desire seems very seems true everything that is not puts us into a rage is it any wonder then that we find it so hard to get at the answer to our problems wouldn't we have the same trouble 
trying to solve a second read or thematic problem if we went ahead on the assumption that 2 plus 2 equal 5 yet there are a lot of people in this world who make life a hell for themselves and others by insist insisting that 2 plus 2 equal 5 or maybe 500 that we can that can we do about it we have to keep our emotions out of our thinking and as Dean Hawks put it we must secure the fact in an impartial objective manner this is not an easy task when we are worried when we are worried our emotions are riding high but there are two ideas that i have found helpful when trying to step aside from my problem in order to see the fact in a clear objective manner number one when when trying to get the facts i pretend that i am collecting this information not for myself but for the other person this helped me take a cold impartial view of the evidence this helped me eliminate my emotion number two while trying to collect the facts about the problem that is worrying me i sometimes pretend that i am a lawyer preparing to argue the other side of the issue in other words i try to get all the facts against myself all the facts that are damaging to my wishes all the facts i don't like to face then i write down both my side of the case and the other side of the case and i generally find that the truth lies somewhere in between these two extremities here is the point i am trying to make neither you nor i nor einstein nor the supreme court of the united states is brilliant enough to reach an intelligent decision of any problem without first getting the fact thomas edison knew that at the time of his death he had 200 500 notebooks filled with facts about the problem he was facing so rule number one was so rule number one for solving our problems is get the facts let's do what dean hawks did let's not even attempt to solve our problem without first collecting all the facts in an impartial manner however getting all the facts is the world won't do us any good until we analyze them and interpret them i have found from costly experience that it is much easier to analyze the fact after writing them soon in fact merely writing the facts on a piece of paper and starting our problem clearly goes a long way towards helping us to reach a sensible decision as charles chattering puts it a problem well started in a problem half solved let me show you all this as it works out in practice since the chinese say one picture is worth ten thousand words suppose i show you a picture of how one man put exactly what we are talking about into concrete action let's take the case of gallon litchfield a man i have known for several years one of the most successful american businessmen in the far east Mr. Litchfield was in China in 1942 when the Japanese invaded Shanghai and here is his story as he told it to me while a guest in my home. Shortly after the Japs took Pearl Harbor, Jalan Litfield begins day came soaring into the Shanghai. I was the manager of the Asia Life Insurance Company in Shanghai. They sent us an army liquidator. He was really an admiral and gave me order to assist this man in liquidating our assets. I didn't have any choice in the matter. I could cooperate or else the or else was certain that i went through the motions of doing what i was told because i had no alternative but there was one block of security worth seven lakh fifty thousand dollars which i left off the list i gave to the admiral 
I left that block of security off the list because they belongs to our Hong Kong organization and had nothing to do with the Shanghai asset. All the same, I feared I might be in hot water if the Japs found out what I had done. And they, they soon found out. I wasn't in the office when the discovery was made, but my head accountant was there. He told me that the Jabs Admiral flew into a rage and stamped and swore and called me a thief and a traitor. I had defied the Japanese army. I, I knew what I knew what that meant. I would be thrown into the bridge house. The bridge house, the torture chamber of the Japanese guest Gestapo. I had had personal friends who had killed themselves rather than be taken to that prison. I had had other friends who had died in that place after 10 days of questioning and torture. Now I was slated for the bridge house myself. What did I do? I heard the news on Sunday afternoon, I suppose. I should have been terrified and I I would have been terrified if I hadn't had a definite technique for solving my problem for years whenever I was worried. I had always gone to my typewriter and writing down two questions and the answer to these questions. Number one, what I'm worrying about. Number two, what can I do about it? I used to try to answer those questions without r writing them down but i stopped that years ago i found that writing that down both the questions and answer clarify my thinking so that sunday afternoon i went directly to my room at the shanghai ymc and got out my typewriter i wrote what i'm worrying about i'm afraid i will be thrown into the bridge house tomorrow morning then i type out the second question what can i do about it i spend hours thinking out and write down the four courses of action i could take and what the probable consequences of each action would be number one i can try to explain to the japanese admiral but he no speak english if i try to explain to him through and interpreter i may stir him up again that might mean that for he is cruel would rather dump me in the bridge house than bother talking about it i can try to number two i can try to escape impossible they can keep track of me all the time i have to check in and out of my room at the ymca if i try to escape i'll probably be captured and shot Number three, I can stay here in my room and not go near the office again. If I do, the Japanese admiral will be suspicious, will probably send soldiers to get me and throw me into the bridge house without giving me a chance to stay a word. Number four, I can go down to the office as usual on Monday morning. If I do, there is a chance that the Japanese admiral may be so busy that he will not think of what I did. Even if he does think of it, he may have cooled off and may not bother me. If this happened, I am alright. Even if he does bother me, I am still have a chance to try to explain to him. So going down to the office as usual on Monday morning and acting as if nothing had gone wrong gave me two chances to escape the bridge house. As soon as I thought it all out and decided to accept the fourth plan to go down to the office as usual on Monday morning, I felt immensely relieved. When I entered the office the next morning, the Japanese admiral sat, sat there with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. He glared at me as he always did and said nothing six weeks later thank god he went back to tokyo and my worries were ended as i have already said i probably saved uh, my life by sitting down that sunday afternoon and writing out all the various steps i could take and then writing down the probably probable consequences of each step 
and calmly coming to a decision. If I hadn't done that, I might have floundered and hesitated and done the wrong thing on the spur of the moment. If I hadn't thought out my problem and come to a decision, I would have been frantic with worry all Sunday afternoon. I wouldn't have slept that night. I would have gone down to the office Monday morning with a harassed and worried look and that alone might have aroused the suspicion of the Japanese admiral and spur him to act. Experience has proved me time. Experience has proved me time after time the enormous value of, of arriving at a decision. It is the failure to arrive at a fixed purpose, uh, the uh, inability to stop going ar around and round in maddening circles that drives man to nervous breakdown on living hell. I find that 50% of my worries vanish once I arrive at a clear, definite decision and another 40% usually vanish once I started to carry out that decision. So I banish about 90% of my worries by taking these four steps. Number one, writing down precisely what I'm worrying about. Number two, writing down what I can do about it. Number three, declining what to do. Number four, start immediately to carry out that decision. Galen Litchfield is now the Far Eastern Director of Star Park and Freeman Incorporation, John Street, New York, representing large insurance and financial interests. In fact, as I said before, Galen Litchfield today is the one of the most important American businessmen in Asia and he confesses to me that he owes a large part of his success to this matter of analyzing worry and meeting it head on. Why is his method is so super because it is efficient, concrete and goes directly to the heart of the problem on top of all that it is climaxed by the third and indispensable rule, do something about it. Unless we carry out our actions, all our facts finding and analysis is whistling upwind. It is sheer waste of energy. William James said this when once a decision is reached and execution is the, or is the order of the day, dismiss absolutely all responsibility and car care about the outcome. In this case, William James undoubtedly used the word care as synonym for anxiety. He meant once you have made a careful decision based on facts, go into action. Don't stop to reconsider. Don't begin to hesitate, worry and retrace your steps. Don't lose yourself in self-doubting which begets other doubts. Don't keep looking back over your shoulder. I once asked Wade Phillips, one of the Oklahoma who most prominent oil men how he carried out decision he replied I find that to keep thinking about our problem beyond a certain point is bound to create confusion and worry bears comes a time when any more investigation and thinking are harmful there comes a time when we must decide and act and never look back why don't you employ Glatton Litchfield technique to one of your worry worries right now? Here's the question number one. What I'm worried about, please pencil the answer to that question in the space below. Number two, question number two, what can I do about it? Please write your answer to that question in the space below. Question number three, here is what I'm going to do about it question number four what I'm going to start doing it chapter five how to eliminate 50% of poor business worries if you are a businessman you are probably saying to yourself 
right now the title of this chapter is ridiculous i have been running my business for 19 years and i certainly know the answer if anybody does the idea of anybody trying to tell me how i can eliminate 50 percent of my business worries it's absurd i